everybody. How are you all doing? Lots of thumbs up. Very well. Uh, shall we jump straight into the agenda, Sean, or do you have anything to insert before that? Yeah, we can do that. Um, sorry, let me bring it up uh, just so everybody's got it real quick. I think, can everybody see the agenda? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so take it away, Bryony. All right, so we don't have any members of the public at this point, correct? Well, we have B Square Beacon. I don't know if Dave wants to say hello. We can unmute him. Yeah, let's go ahead. Hello. Welcome to the meeting. How are you doing? I'm doing great. All right. Well, at the end, if you have any questions, please make sure that um, we hear them. Sounds good? Fair enough. Um, can I ask a quick question at the beginning yes, about the agenda? Because it wasn't, it wasn't available uh, online beforehand. Um, is there going to be any discussion of the mural at People's Park? Yeah. Yeah, Dave, it's on the agenda. Sorry, I, I thought we got that posted. Uh, it's it. Yeah, well, after we do the minutes, we'll dive right in. Oh, I, I see it there. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no, that was my bad. I, I thought we got it posted, so. I'm going to mute myself now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining us. We will go straight into the minutes. I know that Sean shared those with us um, earlier this week. Did everybody have a chance a chance to review them? Um, Everybody see them? Yes. I yes. move to approve the minutes from the June, the June, June meeting, last meeting? June meeting. Yep. June meeting. Do we have a second? Second. Anybody have any changes or comments to make? All right. Well, I motion to approve the minutes. So we'll go down the list as noted on the chat. All right, hold on, my chat disappeared. Somehow you're taking over my entire screen right now. <laughs> oh, am I? Sorry. If you hit escape, it should yeah. reach my chat. All right, um, Karen, you have Karen? So we have to do a roll call vote. Yeah, sorry, y'all. Karen? Nope. Elizabeth? Essence? Yes. Elliot? Yes. Quentin? Yes. Sam? I don't think, in case you joined. Babette? Nick? Yes. Valeria? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Did anybody not vote? All right, the minutes are approved. Sean, do you have any updates on the financials for us? Yeah, I'm showing them right now. Uh, so in the uh, 402, which is our 1% um, fund, uh, we have 61,635. So no changes there. And then from the 403, for those of you, um, the, the newer commissioners, this is leftover funding from when the city used to do a postcard project and for Dave's <laughs> interest, uh, this is uh, leftover money from that. So this is a non, uh, uh, this is a non, uh, once this money's gone, this money's gone. Uh, so this is 3,961. So this is no changes. So we traditionally, this is what we'll support for food and beverage for our um, arts night at City Hall or other kinds of uh, kind of public engagement funding is usually this fund. And then this is leftover money from the 1% um, projects over the last couple of years. It's kind of our rainy day fund for a big project or if we're short on funding. So those are the difference between those two. So that no changes. No changes. Anybody have any questions regarding the financials? All right, let's move right along. So as we know, um, a lot has been happening in Bloomington over the last week. And one of the things that we really need to address is the People's Park mural. Um, so Sean is gonna give us a little bit of the history behind it and kind of some options as to what we should consider moving forward. And we'll open it for discussion after he is done. 
So take it away, Sean. Yeah, so I'm gonna stop my screen. Can everybody see me? I got it on grid view. So, um, so yeah, so People's Park, uh, that mural project specifically has had a couple different iterations and different um, lives. So originally in the late 90s, uh, when Rhinos um, was involved, there were four or five panels that uh, teens through the Rhinos program could, it was basically four by eight sheets. So there's always been this kind of turning or this changing of that mural space. Uh, when I got here in 2016, um, Bicycle Garage asked that structure to be removed um, and Rhinos was kind of in immense transition and so that program kind of faltered naturally and kind of went away. Then uh, we did a, uh, in partnership with the Civil Streets program, we did a mural uh, that was only up for a year and then we brought in Eva Allen through an RFQ process. So it's always been kind of a changing mural. Um, Eva's contract was actually, it commences on August 31st of this year. Because it is a highly demanded space, because of the history, history of kind of that mural changing, it was always with the intention that that mural wasn't gonna last forever. And as we've all talked about, right, uh, no, per, no public art is truly permanent. Um, thinking about how neighborhoods change, communities change, those kinds of things. Um, we tried to do the best we could in terms of uh, a variety of community engaged approaches with Eva. Um, you know, there was the trans flag and the pride flag that was added. Second Street Baptist is in that mural, um, which is de designed by Samuel Plateau, who is one of the first African American architects to break the color barrier in the 30s. So, um, but it was obviously a mural that celebrated diversity through kind of a white lens and through whiteness. Um, so anyways, that's kind of the, the kind of history of this public-private partnership. We technically, can, go, oh, go ahead. I, I, can you tell us a little bit about what the, prop, the history of the property is as well? Yeah, so that, so, well, and just to get into this, the wall is owned by Bicycle Garage. We don't own the wall. We, we have provided mural opportunities, but it's ultimately Bicycle Garage's say on what goes in terms of if the partnership will be continued, uh, if there's another mural, it's ultimately their wall, their property, right, that faces the park. Um, the community has been very frustrated historically because um, there has never really been closure around the history of People's Park uh, for some. So the site was uh, formerly a black owned business uh, that was firebombed by the KKK in 1968. Uh, it was a business that was a, a black owned bookstore and was kind of um, seen as an anchor in the community. There's a really great Indiana archive um, through IU. I think it was a research student that wrote a really amazing kind of history of People's Park um, since the firebombing. The building was uh, deemed unsafe, it was knocked down, and then the property owners uh, deeded, the pro deeded the land over to the city that it had to remain a park. It is one of our only urban, quote unquote, urban parks, and what I mean by that, it's not a green park. Um, you know, it's a lot of, um, you know, pavers, and it's a, th that's what I mean by an urban park. So um, that's kind of the general history of the site, um, the kind of public-private partnership that we're in with uh, Bicycle Garage. Um, so I've spoken with Ann and Bob, and they are uh, comfortable with the potential of pursuing a new mural. Um, they think it's time in terms of uh, kind of community conversations. Um, and so I don't have a plan. I think I wanted to open this up to the Arts Commission for us to discuss. Um, but um, I've spoken with Nick and Bryony uh, about a couple different potential approaches that we could do, which would be um, a more community engaged process um, that would include community meetings and paying the artists to be involved in those community meetings, uh, having it more being more of a community designed mural in, in nature rather than leaving it up to an artist to interpret what the community wants. Um, as well as uh, we tried this with Switchyard Park, being explicit about supporting artists of color um, and making sure that those voices are, are brought up and kind of bumped up through the public art process uh, and, and kind of removing barriers for access in that way. 
um, as well as um, engaging various community stakeholders. Um, I've been playing email tag with Black Lives Matter Bloomington to kind of discuss this approach to see what they would think. I've had a couple inquiries out to um, and spoken with IU First Nations about some language and thinking about um, you know equity through that um, that particular community. Um, so that's that's really that's all I have right now. So there's no, there's nothing set in stone. There's um, we're not the Parks Department is not gonna because the contract is almost almost over. Um, we're not doing repairs on it and we're not um, buffing the mural, which is a, a legal term in terms of uh, painting over the what was written on there. So right now it's going to stay up for the until we figure out the direction of the mural. Okay. I, I see that you want to speak, Rachel. I just want to make sure, is everybody aware of what was that the mural yeah, was? I shared my the screen. Here. Yeah, but if you haven't seen it. It on. was very quick. So I just want to make oh, sure that everybody's up to date on that. Yeah, let me... Uh... And before we open it to discussion, Nick, is there anything you want to add based on your conversations with Sean? Uh, no, I, th I think I think Sean pretty well covered it, and, and I think just uh, uh, obviously it being a private private property, you know, this just just reiterating there are limitations of what we can do, you know. So I think Sean's putting good effort trying to work with um, uh, the property owner property owners um, to put us on a path to maintain um, some partnership with them. Um, but yeah, plan is to leave this untouched in its current state until uh, we, we know what the, the next step is. Okay, Rachel? Yeah, so um, I had a um, protest the past few days have been really intense. Um, thank you to those that have reached out to me. Um, but we, last night after the protest, I spoke with, um, two of the organizers actually about that space and, um, I'm meeting with one of them tomorrow, but we had been talking quite a bit, um, about the, about people's park and what the space used to be and just all of that in general. And they, um, when I told them I was on the arts commission and that we were looking at you know, what the next steps were with that mural. And I told him that, like, I felt it was really important that it's a person of color that actually does do the mural in that space. I think it's really important to be able to, uh, to give the black community, like, a chance to reclaim that space. Um, and because I don't think I fully realized that it was the garage, the, the bike um, shop that owns that wall, but because they do own that wall, we don't necessarily, it's a private, if it's a public private prop, uh, partnership, we don't actually have to go through a full RFQ process or anything like that. Which means like, could we not all discuss different artists that we want to select from and then engage those artists with the community rather than doing an open call and it's like having everyone submit and potentially most of the artists submitting, probably a majority of them, if not all of them being white, can't we, do our own research as a commission um, and seek out um, black artists in our community as well as work with BLM and Enough is Enough and all of those organizations to identify black artists that we can actually reach out to and ask if they are interested in this project. And then asking if they're interested, maybe get it, if let's say three or four are interested, getting a quick proposal from each of them and selecting it that way rather than like going through the usual public art process since it is a private property that's just that's my two cents they had like three or four artists they told me off the bat that they would love to see do that mural which is like why i'm thinking if we can somehow facilitate that keep it more contained might be yeah no that's that's a really great point i i can look into that um i i um this is gonna sound totally absurd um but uh, just because of the current state that we're in, um, people might say that that's, um, we might have to go through a public process, but I think we can do that homework of reaching out to those artists that, you know, that you're aware of, but I think it might have to be a public um, 
legally it might have to go through a public process um, for a couple different reasons. But that's um, similar to what we did with Switchyard, being very explicit about the opportunity and really prioritizing that and protecting that language um, is really important for us moving forward, at, no, ma no matter what, in terms of our commissions, in terms of equity and inclusion. But uh, yeah. it's a great point. I just, I'm curious then, how is this any different than the mural on the B-line with Vectrin? Because that was a public-private uh, partnership. We, and... we, did an, we did an open call. It was an open call. Oh, okay. I didn't recall that. Yeah. Yeah. Nick, you wanted to add something? Uh, go, go ahead, Babette. Hang on, let me, Babette, you're on oh. muted. There you go. I got you unmuted. You're good. Thank you. I have one question. Is there, a, is there a potential for a problem with the owner of the uh, the bike shop or whose property it is saying that, well, I, this, I want this, I won't allow this or anything else? Has that been kind of talked to him so, so that we're not making a decision that he's mm -hmm. going to? They, they, yeah, that, I mean, that's one of the challenges with public-private partnerships. I think they understand, um, Anne and Bob, from what I've um, engaged in, I think they understand the significance of this moment and what the community is going through. And, and they're uh, okay. Us, yeah, us being specific about the black market, us being specific about what happened, but then also thinking about, you know, um, when I was talking with IU First Nations, you know, con continued existence and representation for indigenous communities. You know, that there's that there's like also Black Joy, and Quentin can kind of speak to that in terms of the conference. So thinking about those kinds of narratives and theme works, um, that is one potential scary thing about us being involved in public-private partnerships always, which is the property owner can, we can go through this process, commission work, um, but that's why we have shifted to doing the open call process so we can say, we're selecting these two artists, we're gonna pay them to refine their ideas. Then we can also include the property owner in that conversation so that we don't get down one track and then have to, um, and we, we're, we're not in the business of censorship. Uh, you know, We're always gonna represent the artists. Um, and that's what I try to do as a staffer is represent the artist's intentions with these public-private partnerships. So, but that's a really great point and that is a concern um, I mean, there's concern in the community that um, that this could be vandalized again, or that the property, if it is celebrating black market and what happened is that it could intent, uh, um, uh, incentivize white supremacist groups, right? Like, like this, is, this is the state of affairs we're in and negotiating, I think the role and the responsibility of public art is a really key, um, key aspect in our community, but I think also there's a lot of weight put on that because it is visual, right? And I think a lot of communities right now are going through this with um, a prime example of criticism is the DC mayor uh, putting Black Lives Matter and renaming um, the street that, but then also not actually having a conversation about, um, you know, defunding police and what the community concerns are. So I don't want us to also look like we're doing political lip service without actually addressing other equity issues in our community. And that is something that we as an arts commission need to really, I think I would lean on you all to help with those conversations that we have been trying to do equity and inclusion in terms of our calls and thinking about how we're bringing new artists to the table. Uh, you know, Tyler and I's involvement and, and uh, the creation of the Blackie Brown Arts Festival, those kinds of things I think matter over time as um, addressing these kind of concerns. But I think because it is visual, right? And it is visual art, the crux of that is uh, it, there's a lot of weight in the community on us and on the community through public art in terms of closure, in terms of um, community healing and dialogue. So, Would, would it be possible to um, decide on decide in something thematic that the building owner w would approve before the call and then the call would be more specific, like a mural that tells the story of of people's park or the story of the bombing or um, that that's that would be hard to refute because that's what the place is and it's yeah. a story to tell. We, we, we have had that in the theme when we've done public private partnerships because of the nature of the calls 
mm-hmm. you usually have themes or elements to be included and not limited to. So we can be very explicit. Um, one, so I have like, I've just been taking notes. Let me try to find um, what I have real mm-hmm. quick in terms of some of the language, which I would have the property owner. Um, yeah, I was gonna say the property owner can also be um, involved in the whole process perhaps in a limited capacity at the beginning, mm-hmm. but we shouldn't make any big decisions without kind of their sign off. Yeah, so for example, like themes and elements yeah. to consider would be history of People's Park, the black market with a link to that various website, civil rights history in Bloomington, celebrating individuals like George and Vitali Farrow, the Second Street Baptist Church and its architect Samuel Plateau, uh, Neil Marshall Black Cultural Center, indigenous history and continued existence and representation in the region, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Joy. Like, that's just, that's not finalized language by any means. But those are kind of some of the frameworks that could be included um, just in the conversations that I've been having with community members and other artists and art communities around this kind of process. Well, I mean, I would just suggest that maybe talking to the building owner first, making sure he's on board with this because people are really out of their bloody minds right now. And it's putting it lightly. Um, and, you know, um, if, if I, I think specifically, if we say we want the story told of people's part, then we're being, we're being cut and dried specific to that place and it is hard to refute. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and my, I mean, to eliminate, uh, uh, protests against the BAC for a mural and God only knows anymore. So, and then, and then, and getting his approval up front before we go and then create a whole, an issue where this man has a bicycle shop and then he's got to have protests against his bike shop. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll involve him. It's stupid yeah. saying this, but it, but what's going on now is just so, outrageous and people are so crazed yeah so all right i i see that nick wants to speak as well yeah i mean i think i babette all of your points are are right on you know and i think i just i i do want to reassure that um while while i think the intensity of the current situation and and the his history of this individual site um, mm-hmm. puts extra import on this. Um, traditionally, with with these sort of public-private partnerships, if we've had criteria that we put into um, an RFQ, that is reviewed with the property owner in advance. You know, I think that whatever process we have for reviewing this, um, I think you know we'll we'll be extra. I think we all should make sure that we're extra careful to you know dot our I's and cross our T's. Um, but I think what you're describing um, traditionally has been part of the framework of um, this sort of public-private partnership. But um, you know, I think even before bringing this to the BAC, and even really before any preliminary discussions with, say, Brian and I, um, I know Sean has had multiple conversations with the the property owners. Um, you know, because I think that that the balance that we want to strike is, um, you know. Uh, having having a a piece of artwork that is appropriate to the site you know that isn't um you know just uh, i don't know uh, uh, isn't just sort of you know Pretty flowers <laughs> yeah c- c- commercial like overly overly commercial overly disposable mm-hmm. um you know it, it it doesn't need to be uh a visit Bloomington advertisement, you know, um, at, mm-hmm. at, at all times. And I think that, um, you know, I think the balance to strike is, you know, art can challenge people. Um, it can, um, it can make people uncomfortable, you know, but, you know, should we stop short of making, you know, of, of it, you know, yeah, we want to avoid uh, something that is full on incendiary, you know, and, um, and going to, you know, specifically, in, you know, entice, you know, uh, a lot of volatile reactions. You know, I think, yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to find that balance and that balance, you know, the property owners are going to be part of that conversation. Um, 
you know, but it seems like Sean, you've, you've set pretty good groundwork with them to kind of get us to this point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next Rachel. And then I would like to hear from other commissioners who have not spoken on the topic, please. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, two things that I want to bring up. One is I'm not worried about people protesting if they don't like the mural. I think that then people should protest. I think it's people's park. And I think if people are protesting the BAC, then we did not do our job properly. So I don't think we need to be concerned about protesters. They're not the issue. And they're not the issue of everything that's happening in Bloomington right now, white supremacy is. And so for me, it is very important that we are actually like, we are taking those risks if, if we feel it's necessary and if we think that the community thinks it's necessary and wants to see that happen, then we should do that. I don't want to just like shy away from topics, but I also, Sean, I hear what you're saying. You don't want to, we don't want to increase additional presence of white supremacists in the area. And like, it is very touchy all around and that's fine. But I think if people are protesting, um, with crowds that are similar to what we're seeing this week, that means we didn't do our job right. So I don't think we should be fearing protesters. The second thing is um, beyond what ends up being on the mural, Sean, I really like the list you have put together of a variety of different options to give artists some creative freedom. So it's not so specific, like draw the exact scene or whatever hap that happened in the 60s, but um, keeping it still interpretive. However, I know at one point we had discussed a plaque or something of that sort to um, kind of tell the story, similar to like the plaques along the B-line. Um, is that still in conversation? And um, can we potentially still do that and have it next to the mural or somewhere within the park? Yeah, but also, uh, can we partner with um, IU professors in at Neil Marshall Black History Center and just get have them maybe even craft the actual historical statement um, rather than it us just being pulling something from the web. And then, yeah, People's Park has always been historically for the people, right? So we should really keep that in mind. Yeah, so the, the chamber led that with an IU group. So the okay. uh, so it's the chamber, the city's been involved, but it's really the chamber's lead on that. And then there is a park kind of like in park signage when there's a, um, there's some renovation that's gonna happen to People's Park in the next couple of years. I don't know how that falls because of Switchyard Park and some of the other priorities, uh, like lighting upgrades, those kinds of things. Um, so, but yeah, so I, I believe, I think it got uh, postponed because of COVID actually. So I think the chamber's actually like working on getting it up and running pretty soon in terms of that. And then I believe that the parks department will have a interpretive sign similar to what's in other parks when the upgrade happens. Uh, so that's that's what I know at this moment, um, and um, yeah. So the chamber's been leading that, so that's been going on. I don't think we're concerned about, and just to clear the air, I don't think we're concerned about pro protesters in terms of like. I, I don't think that. I, yeah, I, I'm not concerned about that at all. I think people in the community are concerned about um, the just the current state of affairs we're in and making those kinds of statements and potentially harming their business or harming their co-workers and I can understand that kind of mindset. Um, I get that. Yeah, it was just yeah. mentioned people protesting yeah. the BAC and honestly like I would love to see more people protest us and like push us to do better work and do work that the community wants. So I don't think that's something that we should ever fear. That's all. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts from other commissioners? Uh, I want to say something. I think like I definitely second Rachel and what she said. I think we have been quiet a lot of time, and I think this is the, the right spot um, because of the history of the place. So I think we really need to focus on that. It's the moment, and we need to support uh, the community that it's not, uh, not have been supported for so long. And I also understand the that we need to be sensitive to the fact that the, the the owner of the the wall may suffer consequences uh, depending of whatever uh, it happens in our decisions but definitely i second rachel i think that it's a moment to act and not be afraid 
Anybody else? Karen? I just have a quick, oh, oh. sorry, Karen. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned that if we move too quickly on making a change, that's going to be another kind of statement that we don't want to make. Yeah. Um, so, Sean, can you speak to realistically how long it would be before uh, there would be a new mural there? Uh, we legally, uh, it's uh, August 31st would be the soonest we could do anything uh, based on the current contract. But I don't think, uh, yeah, that's all of concern too. Uh, so I think, you know, having this discussion with you all, uh, engaging some other community members, and then releasing an RFQ, and then maybe, you know, building a time frame into that, it's still going to take us some time. Uh, but we're, we're, I, I've, been a, I've been concerned about the optics of painting over it as well. And, you know, the, and the mayor has been very concerned by that because it could look bad in terms of, I mean, it's a, it's a very well-intentioned addition to the mural um, in terms of the color choice and how it was laid out and those kinds of things. So um, I, I don't have an updated timeline. It's kind of what the commission thinks. I think it's time, I think we'll need to kind of you all as commission members will need to be out there. And, you know, Rachel's connect, very well connected and very close to some of the key organizers. So like having those kinds of conversations will be helpful as we move forward and we think about what is a good timeline for that. Um, but once again, it's it's the property owner at a certain level can do whatever they want. So they could paint over it. Um, I don't know if they will do that, but they do have that option. So I'm trying to kind of, um, once again, the public art being kind of this balance in the community and kind of, you know, um, us kind of um, balancing a, a variety of perspectives and interests in the community as much as possible. So, Quentin. So, Sean, I have a question. When once the the new mirror oh, mural is there, so how many years that it stays there? I kind of missed that. that. Yeah, that's open. So right now, the current contract was three years. I think with this one, we would probably do somewhere between three. No less than three, but no more than five, probably. Um, and just go from there and see how 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 that works with the artist, also the scale, the mural, that kind of stuff. So somewhere between three to five years usually is what we do for that space. So Quentin, Quentin. you have a question. It was also about a uh, timeline and moving forward. So you you kind of touched on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, do you all have an opinion about that? Like, in terms of, like, what do you all think in terms of the, how we should move on this? I mean, in terms of, I mean, the 31st would be the earliest we could do anything. And I don't, I don't know if we're going to hit that benchmark anyways with, I mean, even with COVID and I don't know how artists. I, I think realistically, we're not looking at anything before six months. Right. Yeah. What do the owners think about, like, right now? So it's been, so the Black Lives Matter events sort of put on the space. What are the owners actually saying about the mural, like, as it is, as it stands right now? Like, what are their feelings? And sort of what, I don't know, what do those conversations look like? What do they want to see happen to the wall? Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, they, uh, I haven't spoken with them in about a week. It was, um, I, I spoke to them kind of when it happened and communicated with Eva and all that kind of stuff. And I said, hey, you know, our contract is coming up on this anyhow. Maybe it is time to kind of update and kind of uh, refresh the mural, so to speak. Uh, they were uh, supportive of that. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I haven't had a current conversation with them about timeline and their expectations. Um, so I'll need to go loop back around and have that kind of conversation with them. Um, but they were they were uh, very interested in I think understanding and I communicated to them the importance of the potential of a mural to bring about closure right and I think in a lot of different ways People's Park has never really had that um, I know that there's been various ways of um, you know protesting and gathering there I know that there was a redesign in the late 90s it used to be a very uh, heavily used teen park. And then there was a, an incident that happened with public safety official or individuals. And then the park was kind of uh, lost to that particular community. And then, you know, it had been a site for Occupy and then uh, individuals experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. So it's, it has been this gathering space and, and it's always been a point of contention. Um, when, the, when the EVA's mural was put up, it was um, kind of ill-timed against that. 
and has always been kind of in, in a certain subsect of the community considered Art Washington Park. Um, but at the same time, um, not every public art piece we do is going to make everybody happy, right? And I think we all know that. Um, we've seen it with our even the public cars, public art calls that we've been involved in. But I do think it is an opportunity for us to think about uh, critical dialogue and closure and um, thinking through that strategy and what this means in this moment, um, alongside of addressing other issues of systemic racism, is systemic racism in the community and the other equity issues that we need to address as the Arts Commission, so. Elliot. Oh, yeah. Um, thanks, Brittany. Yeah, this has been super interesting as a newcomer. You know, I, I didn't know this long history of the park. I knew it for what I saw it was, which is kind of like a sort of Instagram selfie background, the sort of like welcome to Bloomington, to be totally crass about it. Um, so it was very interesting to know that there's a longer history there and I'd be very interested in, I know Rachel mentioned this plaque or what have you, but some kind of tangible longstanding memorialization or narrative of that history for people like me who come here and even maybe IU students or, or faculty, what have you, or people who come through the town who just aren't deeply rooted here, uh, that that would be a really interesting approach. And um, I will say, I mean, as someone who used to write a lot about street art um, and not so much anymore, Bloomington has been a very interesting place to see uh, the discourse <laughs> of street art. Um, it's maybe not very artistically sophisticated, but the, the language is interesting. And so it would be interesting in some way, and I don't know how possible and I'm not talking about like a word cloud here, but like it's it's just interesting that there's a lot of public discourse happening with um, with spray paint and graffiti, and and how we could potentially capture that spirit in a way that was meaningful and not like, you know, a kind of series of like bombs. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud, but um, yeah, this seems like an important moment to really to to meet that moment. Rachel. <laughs> okay. It looked like you wanted to speak. All right. Before we kind of pivot into... I wanted uh, to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, Essence, you're okay. the only one I'm missing. Yeah, sure. So I wanted to uh, support what Sean was saying about getting the community involved in this process. I feel like that would be... Um, that could go towards that, that, that community healing effort. Um, especially if we're talking about the history of that location while we're um, discussing possibilities of what goes up as the mural. I, I really like that idea. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm game to like brainstorm what that actually looks like. It's great. Yeah, I think it's going to take all of us uh, in this moment, right? And I think... Um, and, and one one thing I and I might put Nick on blast because I know he's got uh, deep cuts on Reddit, but um, it, it's been interesting in the community too. To I think another thing that we struggle um, both as an organization, I think all of us um, because of is communication and storytelling. And I think this is a moment for us to really kind of talk about that and uh, talk about our process. And um, you know, for us as well, like. Uh, we, it was interesting, we got some criticisms about Nina Abby Chanel's work um, on The Graduate, which is really interesting because her work as an artist right now is the most relevant in terms of what's going on in our country and as, as, as an artist interpreting. But I don't know if people, I, I don't know if it's because we relied too much on that public-private partnership to kind of handle the PR around it. And, you know, there was those kinds of conversations. So I think as we think about this, and Essence brings up a really good point too about really being involved in that community process and maybe um, really kind of doubling down on those efforts rather than, you know, focusing on the finished project. And um, I think that that to me was an interesting criticism of uh, the disconnect between Nina's work in the community and her larger work in nationally and how community members weren't aware of that at all. And so, you know, just thinking about that and you know, Nick and I were talking about, you know, the graduate is supposed to be providing a, a placard there to explain Nina and Nina's work, but like, who know, you know, is, is the placard enough, right? And thinking through, I think all of us, you know, as we kind of leave this meeting over the next couple of weeks, thinking about those things about, you know, the process of community engagement, especially, you know, as we think about this digital platform, um, 
and uh, what that looks like for all of us. So anyways, and then I'll be quiet. All right, we're on point three of 10 for our meeting and we're halfway through our meeting. So I'm gonna pivot and ask Sean, what do you need from us today to keep this moving? Do you need any decisions, any direction? any commitments? I, yeah, I think if you guys are, if you all are comfortable with uh, the general approach that I talked about, I can start to kind of um, share that with the public art planning committee and you all as a whole going into the next meeting, obviously involving the property manager and just uh, kind of making it a big team effort. But if I think you all are in agreement that that is the general direction we should go, I can kind of firm that, um, which would be, like I said, um, you know, beefing up the budget to allow for community engagement and paying the artists in that process, you know, being more explicit about that, um, working on the language and the theme works. I need to, like I said, connect with various community groups. And I would love if you all as community members or BAC members would do that as well on behalf of this project. So those are the two, I would say the two most concrete things that I think I need in, the, in this moment. Anybody have any questions regarding that? those requests. All right. Well, it seems like you have our approval to keep moving forward and just shoot us an email if you need anything specific between now and the next meeting. Yep. Um, can I just make a comment very quick? Yes. I think that the fact that life, um, Black Lives Matters was written on top of the mural is uh, uh, also a good thermometer for us, an indication of the what the society and what the population is really talking about now. I think we should listen to that. Yep. And we can archive that moment too, right? So we have a city archive. I can put the kind of, uh, you know, I have documentation of the murals over the years. And so that, that there, there's also this like digital presence that I don't think we think about in terms of our work. And I just want to put that out there too. Yeah, that's a great idea. This mural was up for nine months or forever long. This is what it was. All right, let's move on to other public art projects. The Trades District Garage, which the RFQ closed today. Yep, I have, uh, I, I don't know, the, the last count I had was 80 and there's still a bunch more in my inbox. So we have a lot of submissions that I have to turn around very quickly. Um, so I will keep you all posted on that. Tyler is working uh, endlessly on updating an Excel sheet for our meeting on Friday. So I'll, I'll have more there. And real quick, I'll just take over for Nick, unless you want to add anything after I get this update. Fourth Street, we're moving forward. Uh, construction has begun. Um, we're, we've had the final meeting with the contract negotiation, so we should get time of paper on that. Uh, Switchyard, I'm waiting on an update from Rachel uh, in that group on the final designs. Uh, and then trades is underway uh, with uh, the engineering and construction design review. So that's been under that's been issued and under contract. And so we're trying to figure out how to build the thing. So those are the updates on those. And I'll keep them brief. And then Nick, I don't know if you need to add anything. Um, I don't think so. Uh, but I will just pose the question. Um, you know, for the uh, trades garage um, project, and I know we've discussed some of this over email. Um, Sean, is there anything you need in the very short term, you know, ahead of uh, that meeting Friday to help prep things? No, I'm going to try to get you all ready to roll Friday at noon. Um, I know Bryony connected me with an architect who's going to serve on the first panel with us. Uh, maybe we'll serve throughout the whole process. Um, and just to give a general update, we'll, we'll try to narrow it down to two finalists um, out of however so many submissions we get pay them to refine their ideas. And then similar to what we did with um, the trade sculpture, build that kind of, uh, it, it'll still be pretty tight because the construction's underway for the garage. And we can't really do a lot of change orders, but if we needed to run electrical in a specific spot or maybe not put up drywall, that's, what we're, that's why I'm trying to rush through, not rush through this, but tee this one up so that we're not doubling up the work and potentially impacting both budgets, um, the construction budget and the art budget, so. All right, not listed here, but do you have any updates on Duke 10th uh, Street Mural or the Jordan River projects? I have put those on pause uh, because of other things. That's fine. Yeah. That just lets us know where we are. Yeah, th those, um, are, those are on my to-do list, but they're kind of paused at the moment. Okay, any questions regarding any of the public art projects? 
All right, that was a quick one. Let's move on to the miscellaneous section. We'll start with the Waldron. If Sean, you can give us an update on what's happening internally, and then Quentin and Nick, you can give us an update on the letter that we're drafting. Yeah, we're, we're still in the process of transferring and trying to figure out what that looks like and where the funding's coming from and what that's gonna uh, be. So I don't, I don't have a whole lot. Um, August is when uh, supposedly the transfer will be complete. Um, and I know that we've gotten a lot of, um, I got a uh, hard mail letter from the Bloomington Watercolor Society. I know Arts Ford Bloomington has written a letter. We're, uh, Gallery Walk has written a letter. So we're getting a lot of those kinds of um, uh, inquiries and, and support to keeping the Waldron and Art Center. So. Uh, Babette, hold on. Let's get uh, just an update from Quentin and Nick regarding the letter, and then we can have comment on the entire topic. Quentin, do you want to go or do you want me to? Uh, you can go. Um, well, short version is uh, Quentin's waiting on me <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to add some to it. Like, basically, um, Quentin and Brian and I did a call with um, Sally Gaskell and a uh, former BAC member and- um, And Mia Michelson. Mia Michelson. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they gave us a really good walkthrough of the history of the building um, and it's, it's different uh, stages of evolution. They gave us some good insight on um, the process involved in, uh, you know, sort of, sort of each of those stages. Um, you know, previous handoffs of, of control and ownership. Um, so we have some good notes there. And then um, uh, Sean and I had a good, good, quick conversation about some stuff. And so I've been like digging through the comp plan and basically looking for um, some good specific buzzwords uh, and concepts for the, um, you know, for for council and and the city. But uh, uh, Quentin did the the heavy lifting of of writing the first draft of the letter, which is fantastic. So I'm just going to try to pepper in some things. All right, and when all of that is completed, you'll share it with everybody to get you know any additional comments or notes before we sign it as a commission. Hopefully, before the next meeting. Yep, indeed. Okay. Uh, questions regarding the Waldron. Babette. I just have one question, Sean. Do you know if Abby what, what equipment Abby Tech is leaving or not, or if the city's buying the theater or and all the rest of that from? Yeah, them? I don't know. I, I do not at this moment. We we're very concerned about that too. I know probably a lot of the ceramic studios and the classroom stuff will probably go to main campus. Yeah, we're trying to. There, and there was some stuff that was handed down from the BAC B, BAAC to the Waldron. So we have kind of a track list and that's part of it, right? Because we, we don't want to take the building if there's no lighting for the theater, right? So we're trying to negotiate what, what's staying and what's going. So I think a lot of it will, uh, I'm under the impression that a lot of it will stay other than the classroom spaces, stuff like that, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Elliot, did you want to speak? Or did I just see your hand go by? Okay. Oh, no, I'm just, just gesticulating. Yeah, it's my okay. listening gesticulation. Rachel? This isn't about the Waldron, though, so I don't know if we're going to get to grants and stuff. I, I, know, I know we don't have a lot of info on grants. I just have a question. Should I wait? Hold on on that for just Got a second. Uh, one thing to consider for everybody regarding the Waldron is the Ivy Tech Awards that happen at the end of the year. Um, those will obviously not be happening. And I just want thinking and um, overall opinions from you, perhaps at the next meeting, if you can just take that as homework um, as to what role the BAC should play in those. Sorry, UPS is arriving or something is happening with my dogs. Um, just to figure out, you know, if we want to kind of take over that or what role should we play in the Ivy Tech Awards as they played for the community. Um, with that- Hey, hey Bryony. Yeah? That's just a very quick question. Like, yeah. um, 
I'm curious, how many people on the commission have been to the Ivy Tech Awards before? Okay, cool. Um, I attended last year and it was eye-opening in the sense that there is a lot of potential, but I think it went untapped. Um, and if you remember from the strategic plan research that we did, there was several kind of requests from people saying, I would like to be recognized as doing something important for the city of participating of um, just doing a good job kind of thing. So there is, there is potential for us to step up and not necessarily name the artist of the year, but perhaps, um, you know, community engagement and other things that could come from the name of the city without creating offense or highlighting one business or one group over another entirely on name and talent and recognition, but effort and um, how, they, how they are impacting the city. Well, I think also to the, I, the original awards, the community awards, I think, was the Bloomington Area Arts Council, and it was their kind of advocacy moment. Uh, it was a way to generate more advocacy, and then I think Paul kind of tried to take that on as well. So one thing for you all to consider too is how, moving forward, how do we want to deal with Arts Night? Is there other opportunities to do that? Is that the potential? You know, so I would start to think about, um, I think we do need to do advocacy in the community. So the question is, what does that look like? And, um, Maybe it's maybe it's through Arts Night in June with the grantees and other you know maybe it's more of an art celebration in general, not just to celebrate the grantees. So that's just something to consider. Exactly, and some of that is included in that um, BAC rethought document, and also as drafted in the um, first strategic plan that we were working back in January. That I emailed you all the link um, at the end of the meeting last last month. So that brings us back to kind of giving you an update on the BAC Rethought document, which unfortunately did not get a lot of traction this month. Um, I did not get enough feedback to really give you a consolidated update. Karen had some questions, Elliot had a couple of comments as well, and Babette, you shared an email with all of us that basically kind of covered a lot of what is in the strategic plan. So at this point, I just want to open it to the floor to very quickly see if there's any updates or anybody had additional thinking on this that is not reflected in the document so that I can keep moving this forward and really start to walk away from just figuring out who we are or who we want to be and what we want to do and start to apply that into a more tangible strategic plan and um, actionable items moving forward. Um, I would like to say something. I think like um, uh, regarding Babette's uh, comment, I completely agree with her that education is a very important factor that we should uh, definitely consider to bring it back if we are going to split the groups. I really think that the idea of uh, uh, having the, the, the groups and the discussion, it can work very well. And, uh, but um, of course, I appreciate Byron and all the work that you did putting those ideas together. I was like at the first meeting last time I was thinking, oh my goodness, this will be a lot of work. But yes, I think like when I saw uh, how you line it up, it is possible to do. And um, uh, I do, uh, I did see like, um, first thing that came to my mind was if we would um how we would group them it is by uh, business um like a non-profit or either different areas and um so i thought it was very interesting i have my opinion with that if we're gonna vote i i really would like to express and um what i think about it um, but anyway, I feel that um, it's very important and uh, I had a, a meeting with Byron when we're saying that I'm looking for different ways that maybe we can find to support local artists that are not just by uh, grants, uh, if that is a, a different ways. I have been researching on that 
and uh, I found something that may be an interesting alternative for us that can work together, not to replace the grants, but some other alternative for artists. Um, and it's kind of a platform where would be uh, putting the people that want to donate uh, those sponsors uh, and the artists that can put there, what are my needs for my project, what it is, and then when the, the, the donor see it and that he wants to donate, he can choose and, and kind of fund that project without us having to go to a, a grant. So there are some things that I'm looking for. I'm particularly as an artist, I don't like the grant um, idea. It's a kind of complicated for many artists. Uh, and just uh, one of the things that I want to point out is that uh, going back to how to group those people, I do want to express my opinion that um, dividing the individual independent artists as a business, we are not a business. This is a tax classification that we have to follow in, but we are not a business. We are very disorganized and we really don't, cannot compete into the world of a nonprofit or profit business. So just some thoughts that come to my mind. Fantastic. That was great feedback. Anybody else? Rachel? Um, we kind of, I think, spoken about that, similar to what Valerie was saying, uh, back when, when Andy was the um, chair of the commission about, like, how do we start bringing in dollars that um, from businesses that can then be redistributed, not necessarily as grants or anything like that. So kind of a similar approach of connecting businesses with artists. Um, I'm hesitant though on a lot of, a lot of that approach in the sense that, um, the, technically the Arts Alliance, um, of Greater Bloomington is that resource for the individual artists. So it, it looking through Babette's email again, like I totally agree that we should be connecting existing groups with people rather than reinventing the wheel. And to me, that feels very much as if we're reinventing the wheel because that is part of the mission of an organization that is already in this town. So I think really it's, it's getting back to like, how are we helping people find these organizations and putting and connecting them rather than us doing additional work to, to try to connect individual artists with an individual business. Um, so that's kind of a twofold, totally agree um, on the, the need to, to be more of a liaison and, and generally helping people understand where all the different organizations are in this town. Um, I have a question about the education stuff a little bit. I do think that our role is important um, as a commission to be educating the community and um, facilitating an advocacy, but what exactly do you mean by education? Because I've said this in previous meetings, I am very hesitant on us coming up with, you know, monthly workshops, weekly work, whatever it looks like, that's really should not be our role. Um, I think it's great if we can help facilitate and partner with another organization to host a workshop. Like there's, um, I don't know, like partnering with the IAC to do a whole session on grants because they actually do that. They will come down and do a whole training on that um, and hosting those, but not having us actually be the ones that are planning something from start to finish. Um, so I'm just trying to wrap my head around what education is because I do think it falls under community engagement. And then I think that it's actually a much broader conversation because community engagement is not just educating people, but it's also learning from our community. So I just wanted some clarity on like what we meant by education. Okay. Who wants to define education? Babette. Well, I think your points are extremely well taken, Rachel, and, and the same thing for Valeria. But what I see our role is not taking over any of the existing organizations but connecting those organizations and helping them with their needs and helping them to connect with each other. Um, 
One of the things that, that my understanding, and again, I'm kind of new here like Elliot, um, maybe a few years extra, but not much. But um, I think one of the problems that Bloomington has had is that they've had so many well-meaning people who have tried very hard to get different things going and, and started. And a lot of times they've been clashing with each other as opposed to working together. So I, I see the BAC as helping to facilitate the groups to work together. That when it comes to if, um, uh, if, if um, there, there are two levels of grants, you have organizations which need grants and, or, and you have individuals who need them. I think what we should be doing is trying to help the different organizations in town talk to one another and see what it is that we could do for them um, to help them. Um, the, other, the other thing, I mean, right now, everybody in, the, um, in any form of the art community is pretty shot um, without any outlets. And there are a lot of different places that are doing very creative things. Maybe it's just a matter of, of, um, of reaching out and trying to have different groups get together to talk about it that would give them ideas to help make them a little bit more whole. So I think there's just a lot of a lot of things within the community that um, that we can do. Um, I I um, so that's how I see education in general. Um, we uh, I I've done various seminars in town which were things very simply, different levels of building, whether it was sophisticated web shot, a website selling, you know, product, doing things, how you can put your groups together where people just don't know, or just doing uh, small things on how to set up a business, how to set up a not-for-profit. Um, and I mean, there are just so many things that there's some that, that, um, that I think we could help with. I, I mean, I can hear that, and I agree that, like, oh, sorry, there was an echo. Um, I agree that, like, there definitely is room for all of those things and teaching people how to build websites and do all of that, but that, to me, that is not our role in the sense that um, I just, I, that's, that's not our role to be teaching um, in that sense, because we also need to be planning the strategic plan to be a long term plan that is hopefully sustainable. And my concern is like, what happens when, you know, you leave potentially, and then there isn't somebody Die that off. is equipped to be <laughs> leading that, right? Or what happens when like, you know, I leave or whomever leaves, we want whatever we put in a place now to be able to be handed off in a way that new commissioners after our terms are up. Um, they're able to kind of continue with whatever work we've started. Like we're building that foundation. And I'm concerned that as we are talking about this, we're, we're, I love that we're like dreaming big and we're like, these are all the things that we need because I'm in total agreement. Like we do need those resources, but I don't think that we can dive straight into that because we don't even have the foundation built yet. And we need to like, think about longevity a little bit more rather than a short-term fix. And that's kind of, I don't know. No, I, I, let, let me, if I define it this way, you're absolutely right, because we want to look at it in the macro, not the micro. And if we're looking at it, not so much as these are the, these are the things that we need to teach, but that this, but that we become facilitators. That's all that under, uh, uh, that we are looking at the things that we, we can facilitate and can make happen. We have a committee that's set up for that. So instead of right now, would it, and, and I, I may be totally wrong, but we're one big committee, uh, so to speak, with two sub ones underneath it, um, you, you, know, the pub, you know, public art and grants underneath it, that I'm just suggesting that we put underneath that some, a couple of other things in place in terms of structure that can then decide how they're going to go and reach out. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we have a community engagement subcommittee, yeah. for sure. Yeah. 
Quentin? So I was just thinking about sort of defining education. I, I think I agree with both of you all. I kind of do feel, uh, I, so I hear a bit and I hear Rachel as well. I feel like I'm leaning a little bit more toward feeling like some of this, I could see this getting sort of out of hand, right? Uh, and I think that that mm -hmm. feels like what Rachel's concern is, like us taking on a responsibility for a lot of these things. But I think that there is a way for us to sort of piggybacking on Sean and Essence's earlier point. Uh, some of the, to me, some of the community engagement work is also education, right? So maybe it's not necessarily us having to worry about like, what does it look like for Rachel or Brian or somebody to sit down and have to plan out a workshop like consistently, but even thinking about things about like, like how we could bring in a community members to talk about um, the people's parking that sort of history to me is an educational opportunity, right? Like in those sorts of dialogues, right? How do we, how can we sort of facilitate, create, facilitate the space for those dialogues that happen and maybe what does it look like for us to, who do we bring in to do that so that it doesn't end up being something that like Rachel or Elliot or somebody else is having to take on like control of these workshops because it does feel like something that could then be more sustainable, right? Like if we say we want to host four community dialogues uh, and we can bring in outside people to host those conversations and to talk about uh, the role of public art in the, uh, in the city of Bloomington. Uh, I think that that feels like something that is a bit more sustainable uh, yeah. and something that we could uh, maintain long term. And it hits both of those sort of educational goals as well as our community engagement goals. And I think particularly now, it feels like we're in a decent time to do that because I think it'll be easier to get people, it's easier to get people to come to a Zoom meeting than it would have been to get them to come to City Hall, right? <laughs> and that's just real. Uh, and I think that having these sort of platforms now gives us uh, an opportunity to open up access and maybe interest because we could, I just, I just imagine us being able to bring in so many different people uh, to lead those sort of dialogues and conversations just from the networks that each of us have. Um, it feels like there's a way that we can do this that doesn't create uh, more stress. Yeah. Um, and, and I, that was, that is closer to what my original intention in including this into the document was is we are enablers we're just bringing in groups or individuals into one room to have a conversation and the commissioner involvement one is just coming up with the idea of what and all of this can be pretty much set in stone for the next five years is figuring out you know what happens when um and which ones are free kind of like free topics for something that is timely and relevant um, and then just having a commissioner kind of take the lead for one meeting, because I don't want it to be always myself, but have diff that way we have everybody have a presence and everybody gets to be known by our citizens. Um, and it's just, you're the one who introduces the speaker. You're the one who says, thank you. And I have one more question for you and that's it. Um, so really it doesn't require a whole lot of legwork. Um, any other comments regarding this. Blair. Yeah, I want to add it to this. And uh, yeah, Quinton, thank you very much for bringing it out. I feel like when I think about, uh, I think my mind is set up like I want to find ways that you really, we really can um, empower local artists. And uh, I, when I talk about education, I'm not talking about education people, how to write grants or education, educating the artists, but I talk about how can we um, empower the artists to educate the community. So we have a, a powerful tool. We have some uh, very good skills. And uh, so how can we bring it? One of the things that you have in the document is like empower uh, young um, youth. So how can we, instead of just offering grants, maybe we can um, think about how can we fund programs that will educate uh, the community, that will serve the community to open the horizon of arts. And instead of just giving a grant for an artist to do a performance or create some or release a CD or something that it's really uh, into their own and just our own profit, but also to encourage that we're gonna share our um, skills, artists, and uh, to the community in Bloomington so we can uh, let this artistic community flourish in Bloomington. And that's what I'm talking about education. I really went to uh, some um, 
grant and uh, workshops and things like that. And I and, and end up never writing a grant for my art. But if you ask me, can you come and uh, teach uh, youth? And even if it's for free, I will do that from my heart. I don't want to do that. But what I'm saying is how alternatives we have that we can be, make our, what I'm looking for is how can we enrich our community artistically and how can we use the artist um, as a um, facilitator to uh, enable that um, flourish into the arts in Bloomington. And just to uh, finalize, I want to make very clear that as an artist, uh, Bloomington organizations never paid me uh, the only one that paid me to work for them was Trash and Refashion. And this reflects a lot of times we do fund organizations, but because of uh, it's more convenient to bring money from outside if we have or to invest in artists that comes from outside. So that's what it is paid. And a lot of times artists, local artists are asked to perform or to do uh, their art for free free as a marketing. So I just want to point it out, and I think that uh, uh, my role into this <laughs> commission is more and more, it's becoming to become a voice for independent artists in town that, uh, and how can we make um, these people kind of work to the community and be uh, funded for their work. So that's what I'm talking about education, not just us educating them, but how can those artists can educate the society and how can we uh, fund them to do that? Nick? I, I think, um, Valeria, I think everything you're saying, I get it conceptually and I, I agree with it, um, I don't know, ethically, spiritually, whatever, you know, like I, I, I agree that, um, you know, one of the scourges of society is arts, you know, artists, musicians, whatever flavor being expected to perform for the sake of self-promotion or self-marketing or whatever else, right? Like people should be paid for their work, you know, same as if someone's working on your car or whatever else, right? Like, um, so I agree with that. I, I think the thing I'm struggling to connect um, is exactly what, um, what our role is in that. Like when I, when I hear you talk, I, I hear that, um, like thinking about grants, grants and the 1% through our public arts um, uh, committee, those are the two sources of funding that we have, you know? And so, um, and, and there are guidelines for how we have to apply that funding. And so if we're talking about making funding available to other artists, it either, you know, maybe it fits within the education realm, you know, maybe it is, um, you know, we coordinate uh, like a workshop and there's the workshop on grants, but maybe there's the other workshop on how to engage with foundations or how to seek, um, you know, sponsorship or whatever else. That's not my area of expertise. So I think there's maybe an educational lens, um, but the rest requires fundraising, um, which is, a, I think, a, a huge endeavor um, for us and, and probably not our, our best, uh, the best use of our, of our energy. So I just, I guess what I'm trying to understand is if I'm uh, grasping your view correctly or if there's something I'm missing. Like, like um, I, I think it's the fundraising, or maybe not fundraising, I think it's the financial part, the, the funding of artists part that I'm not quite following what, what you want us to do. Or is it just perhaps an evening where it's the topic to discuss is artist pay and educate the festivals that are you know, guilty of doing this and why that is not the way to go, you know, finding somebody who can present to the topic, why that's not the way, right way to go and what are some alternatives? What are the best practices? Yeah. Would that, Sorry, Brittany. Would that speak to your need, Valeria? <laughs> yes, sorry, I was trying to find my own mute, my video. Yes, uh, I think that it's, uh, and that's more or less, and uh, thank you, Nick, for bringing, that's what I'm brainstorming, trying to see other countries, 
trying to see other uh, models. And if there is anything <laughs> that we can do to maybe kind of, um, in a sense, help more. I don't know, but yeah, that's, thank you. Thank you, yes, it's all- So, so you, you see a need and you're, you're saying like, how do we address it, right? It's sort of an open question. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Yeah. I just, I wanted to make sure there wasn't a specific idea that you were proposing that I was missing. No, no, okay. no, no, right. no. It's not <laughs> a specific yeah, idea. It's, it's, it's just a, like, how can we really address the, um, yeah. this issue? It's yeah, and a this big, is a big complicated this is, question to think about. Yeah. Yeah. This is something that I talked with Valeria about um, separately. And so we agreed that she would do some research and try to figure out if there was something that we could apply um, at our scale moving forward to address this issue. So she's going to take this on um, as kind of like her her research project and her contribution to, to the BAC. Um, so I know that Karen wanted to speak at some Go point. I'll We've, follow up. Um, and just before I let her speak, I want to let you all know that Karen has offered to take on the, the drafting of the strategic plan um, perhaps with your help, Rachel, for sure, since you were so um, yes. involved in that other draft. And there's a lot of information that you can share with Karen. And obviously, if anybody else wants to help in, um, I'm sure Karen would appreciate that. But really, kind of, she's going to take the helm on this one. And uh, hopefully, that we're going to start, you know, to have everybody take a little thing here or there. Um, Nick and Quentin with a letter. But that is looking into how to break down um, the potential of, of the uh, educational nights and things like that. So Karen, you wanted to say something. Uh, yes, I, I think that um, uh, when I mentioned education, I had a very different vision of what that meant. And it certainly wasn't giving workshops. <laughs> um, I, I was more interested in how we might get involved with arts educators and children as seeing them as a component of the public. Um, and, uh, you know, not necessarily thinking about any specific thing that we might do, but thinking about using them as a resource, uh, about thinking about the next generation of artists and art appreciators and how we might uh, envision that in our work as well. Um, so, um, you know, pardon me if that was, was when I sent that in the email, that was taken uh, very differently than how I meant it, so. <laughs> um, and secondly, with the um, strategic uh, plan, Rachel, thank you, thank you, thank you <laughs> for working with me. Uh, um, I, my, my feeling is, is that part of the reason that it's sort of bogged down is that we're getting into a lot of detail about um, how we're going to do things. And I think what we need to really look at is just what, what are our goals? What do we say is our goals for the next five years? And we have, you know, we have any number of ways to operationalize those goals. And I think that that's what our meetings will be about um, and how we go about that. Um, for instance, when Babette talked about, well, we need someone in charge of community engagement and, and et cetera. Um, I think it's enough just to say these are going to be, you know, our foci for, you know, um, the next five years, and we're going to really work toward um, strengthening uh, our understanding and our participation in these areas. Um, so in many ways, I think from the strategic um, plan document that we started out with and the one that uh, Bryony gave, uh, I think they could actually be two documents. I think we can have an inner, inner focused working document and then the outer document that will give us a lot more flexibility because uh, who knows what's going to happen next. I mean, every time I think that things aren't going to happen, they do. <laughs> and then we, I mean, it's just, you know, I, I don't know what to expect at this point. So I think it's, it, flexibility is really important. Uh, so that's the tactic that I'd like to take. I'm very happy or any feedback from, from folks if you haven't had a chance to give it. Uh, and I'll get working on this, you know, pretty quickly. That's all I had to say. Babette? I, I highly echo what Karen said, because to me, the document needs to be about our goals and a basic structure, an overview structure, without the little, the details as to what it specifically means or doesn't, that that comes next. It's that big 
balloon that we need first. Yeah, and that's why. If I can help you, it I would be my pleasure. And if I'll just confuse the issue, <laughs> that's fine too. Yeah, and that, that was kind of the intention of the rethought document. It was to get yeah. rid of all of the noise in the conversation. The little, yeah, the petty um, stuff and in it. Focus on the big picture. Um, Rachel, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, just it, it was. It's more of a question for Valeria in um, thinking about the uh, how we can support individual artists differently. And I think I agree with Nick's point. I initially interpreted your um, your suggestion as as being very fundraising focused. Like we would have to raise funds in order to pay artists to do work, do things for us, like give talks and seminars and whatnot for us. And we don't have the funding or the time to do that. So I I think I'm assuming then that the approach is not the BAC is bringing in local artists to teach something and we're paying those artists, but rather we are working with other organizations to connect with those artists so that those organizations pay those artists. Am I understanding that right? Okay. Yeah, so I think like that, the, the goal would be to maybe be able to uh, have this way that uh, people don't have to be to, to a grant, but say, I have a project, I need this and this and this and this. And that is there. Somebody wants to fund it so we can connect them to fund it. So I don't, but like I said, I don't know what it is. I really, this is a brainstorming thing, but I just feel like if we have opportunities to find a different way, it would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, I think individual artists will probably show up in the strategic plan somewhere. So yeah. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Okay, so we are uh, down to five minutes. And I know that we can continue this conversation for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see your hand, Babette. But before we move on, I just want to see if Dave oh, has any questions before we run out of time. Because we can choose to go over if we want to, but we need to be aware of mm -hmm. public. Dave, do you I have, have anything? Question. Wait, sorry, what did you say? Does Dave have any questions oh, as part sorry. of the public before we run out of time? public time. Oh, are you asking me if I have questions? Yes, if, be, because we only oh. have five minutes left in the meeting. I want to make sure that if you had any questions or comments. Yeah, Dave, we're trying to be respectful of your time since you've been uh, on the meeting. Oh, well, first of all, thank, thank you so much. Uh, second of all, um, I heard at some point during the meeting, uh, someone mentioned the idea of uh, how Zoom is, is, a, is a great tool. Um, and I, I totally agree, and every public body that I brush up against, I, I try to encourage them to find a way to maintain uh, as an augment um, to in-person meetings once they eventually resume, uh, some kind of a Zoom portal um, so that a member of the public would have an opportunity to, to watch the meeting and also uh, to weigh in and, and comment. Um, because the, the Bloomington Arts Commission is not something I would ever have the time to, to make time to cover. Um, it's a happy coincidence of the city council being on uh, break right now um, and the fact that you guys are on Zoom. Um, so I hope that you'll, you'll consider at least um, exploring the idea of maintaining uh, Zoom access to meetings um, even when you're all in the same room, if there's one laptop running, sort of broadcasting the meeting on Zoom so that somebody can not only watch, but also weigh in. And you also, I mean, CATS doesn't typically record you guys. Um, and Zoom is a way to get a, sort of a, a, a version of it recorded so that it's preserved in a way that, uh, that, that these meetings haven't been up to now. So anyway, thank, thank you so much. Um, enjoy listening to not just the people's mural discussion, but all the rest of it. I feel like I learned a lot more about how public art works just for having sat through the meeting. So thank you. Well, we appreciate having you here with us tonight. And thank you for the feedback. Okay, Babette, one more comment. Quick thing. Uh, we did not discuss the meeting for that they had about the hospital site. 
Yeah, we're not going to discuss that one tonight. Um, there hasn't really been that much update. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, I found it absolutely fascinating uh, and highly encourage anyone who can pick it up who didn't see it. And it's and that's, an, again, another opportunity for us to be involved in a very big picture. So that was it. Very much so. Correct. All right. So regarding the BAC rethought document, I encourage you to add any comments, notes, or observations that you want to make sure that Karen has as she starts to lead the strategic plan. And Karen, reach out to anybody, if Rachel or Babette, who have you know, shown interest, but anybody else that you think might help with a specific section, um, you just send them an email and tap into them. Um, I'm sure everybody's willing to give it, lend a hand as needed. Um, and before we wrap up, I have one, well, actually a two-part question for all of you, as I find ourselves basically in the middle of the year. And, you know, when you are in a job, whenever you are out in the world, there's a moment where you have to kind of self-observe and review what you have done and what you want to do. So I would like if you could answer what is the most relevant thing that we have accomplished in the first half of the year as the BAC. Anybody? Are we answering now? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, I didn't know if we were- What do you think, to you personally, what is the most relevant thing we have done in this first half of the year? Shifting our grant funding to support during COVID, like an immediate response um, shift as well as partnering with the BUEA to increase the amount of funding available and to have enough funding for hopefully a second round since COVID's not going anywhere. Yeah, I would totally agree. I, the versatility, the nimbleness of that is pretty incredible. Um, and I think it's, it's a testament to the work y'all have been doing um, and that I've largely been observing. And then also just knowing that local governments have a certain level of nimbleness that state and federal governments just really can't you know, at a kind of level to observe of like what the local needs are, yeah. So thank you, Sean, for all of the hard work on your end as well to make yeah, that happen. Too. And for the, the speed, how you did that was amazing, thank you. It takes a village, I didn't do it alone, so. It takes a village, but personally, I think that is also the most relevant thing that we have done. And I really wanna highlight the fact that Sean was so instrumental in making that happen, as well as Rachel and you know, everybody that was involved in the nitty gritty, but it required a lot out of Sean beyond what is expected. And I really appreciate that. So that leads me to the second question is, what do you think should be the most relevant thing that we accomplish before the end of the year? I could answer again, but I'm gonna let someone else go first. <laughs> I definitely would say uh, whatever co community conversation we're going to set up around People's Park. Full agreement. I think when you focus on how we engage with the community more when it comes to public art, is specifically People's Park. Any other um ideas or needs or just approve of that idea? Uh, can I ask a question too uh, on that note though, uh, specifically, I mean this, in terms of, we kind of talked about this, What what is the, how do you all, how do you all view those street murals, the Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, Black Trans Lives Matter that are going up in cities with the traffic paint? How do you, how do you, how does the art commission feel about those murals? Depends who's doing them. It depends who's leading the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of them that have been, personally, I think a lot of the ones that have been put up around cities have been um, done with a white lens. And I think that that's, that's problematic because action's not being taken beyond that. It's a lot of virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be very wary of that. Um, I don't know how, I'd be interested actually to hear in how other people feel about it, because that's just been my take from the articles I've read. 
Yeah, I would agree. Um, I know I made some comments about it earlier, but it's I'm not used to a place that has this kind of like very literal verbal kind of uh, graffiti culture. And it does feel like a lot of virtue signaling to me. It feels like a kind of analog version of social media. Um, and so it's, I don't know who these authors are. They're anonymous to me, but I just getting a sense of the climate and the politics of the community. It, it, I think there's a lot. I think we should go a lot deeper than just those statements. Um, so I, I think that the history behind that space gives us context and um, it complicates uh, that that mural, uh, that space, because it's just not coming out of the blue. We're not just planting the streets because people are protesting. There's history and there's context that's already built into that space. Now, if we were just painting it down all of Kirkwood, that'd be different, or all down Walnut or um, College, that would be different. But it seems that location carries with it um, the history that um, the other spaces didn't necessarily have. So um, I think the way that we bolster that is to, to have those conversations that we're talking about. We're not just slapping it on the wall. We're not just having anybody slap it on the wall, um, but we're gonna have that, that effort put in um, and, and have the people there. Hopefully, if, if they push back, we, we understand why. And, and we can move from there. Babette? I, I just want to echo how profound I think what Essence said is, is that history uh, does give context and that that is what is the most important thing for us to do, specifically in People's Park, but throughout the city. Uh, when you travel through Europe, one of the things that, that always impressed me so was every, every street I went down, there was always a plaque that explained historically what had happened, what hadn't happened. And um, I, I think it, the more I learn about the history of Bloomington, I mean, listening to Joy Reid on MSNBC, and I think that art and it's a chance for us to reflect on that history and also for what we do to reflect that history. Nick? Uh, I, I, I totally agree with all that. And I think that, um, you know, if, 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 if we're talking about like a very hyper-specific thing that we could accomplish through the end of this year, I totally agree with, um, you know, the, the mural at People's Park. I think maybe it's sort of a broader concept that I would attach to that is that, you know, if we can finish this darn strategic plan, um, and it, that that obviously, but I think that like sort of the, the footnote there is when we we're talking about uh, education earlier, um, Quentin, I think basically articulated exactly where I sat in that conversation. Um, but I think that what I would hope comes out of this strategic plan is not just that we come up with a bunch of like titles and subcommittees to go do hyper specific things towards that end, but that we uh, create a framework to apply different lenses to everything we do, including the existing things that we do, you know, and so, you know, I think what we're talking about right here is how do we apply the educational lens, you know, or the community engagement lens to this specific thing? And how do we make sure that um, our strategic plan and, you know, our structure is set up such that we make sure that we apply that sort of lens to future things that we do, right? Like, I think that, like, you know, six years from now or whatever, when none of us are on this um, this commission, it's I don't think we really care as much whether people um, uh, do are promoting workshops or doing social media or whatever else. It's are are they applying these concepts, you know, to whatever they're working on at the time? So I'll get up my soapbox, but I think y'all are smart. Fantastic. Any final thoughts on any of this? Grant's question. Is now yes. a good time to ask it? OK. Uh, sure. Cool. Uh, yeah, I agree with what everyone said earlier. Essence, I said it. I think you said it beautifully for here. Um, 
my take was more just like on what's happening in other cities right now. And I think it's good we're talking about it because we don't want to do that here in this town. And I don't think we will. Um, my grant question is, as happy as I am that we've we turned that application process and everything around so quickly, um, Sean, I haven't heard anything about whether or not we're still hopping on calls with people to talk to that to the organizations that were given a grant. And I have no idea what the status is of funding and when funds are going out and we are still in the midst of COVID and I would love to help. And I don't know if anyone else has any ideas of how they want to just like keep communicating with those that were awarded funds because it's been a few months since we've reached out to any of them to say anything it's like you're awarded and then we've kind of gone silent I feel like have you collected all of the signed MOUs or like what's yeah. this yeah I mean we yeah I've been communicating with folks everybody except for three groups should be paid by now um or it should be it's there it's in the PO process um we had to get new documentation from the BUEA funding mechanism since it was two different pots of money but everybody should be getting paid within the next 30 days um, that have submitted their paperwork we haven't I haven't had a chance to schedule a call with all the grantees yet I have had a couple calls with venues and music promoter uh, since our last meeting uh, the festival calls kind of fell off because everybody is either going digital like Midway and uh, Lotus is going digital. Um, so I didn't feel like we needed to continue those conversations in the meantime. Um, but the idea is to get uh, now, uh, Tyler has compiled and is, has like a kind of um, a Venn diagram of groups that I've talked about collaboration issues. And so I, I just haven't had a chance to connect with her on that. But the, the hope is to move forward on that. Um, and once again, I've been kind of holding back on the second round of BUA funding just to see how this year is shaking out with everybody um, and seeing what um, the kind of needs are. The venue group asked to um, have a survey done, uh, which I've started to compile notes and started to get drafts on like how getting through 2020 and into 21 people are feeling. So that's that's just a quick update on that. Um, but I've always also been kind of um, pulled in a couple different directions. So I haven't been as um, on the ball on that as I Okay, I mean, let me know how I can help. Um, as grants chair, I wanna be able to help in some way with this, especially since like, we're out of the chaos of the middle of the grant cycle. Um, now is like when I can be that post grant support. So yeah, I, yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, it really, it took, a, it took a while for people to sign the contracts and get, the, get their uh, affidavit signed and their paperwork filled out. I mean, I, I'm still hounding people weekly to turn in their paperwork, so. Yeah, I mean, I still signed a contract just this morning. Yeah, yeah, I mean. From it, one of the grantees. Yeah, so, I mean, they've they've had that for a while. So it's, it's yeah, so most, uh, let me look this up real quick. I think uh, most everybody except for and actually, while you're looking that up, um, I would, I kind of want to get a feel from all of you. I would like to start the grants conversations again, like subcommittee meeting, whether it's once a month or once every other month right now as we figure stuff out. But um, in August next month, I would love to start those up again so we can start thinking about next year, be prepared to jump in and help and shift gears and whatever the BUEA needs as we approach fall. Um, Grants have, has also, like, the committee has, it's usually me, Elizabeth, and Quentin. Um, Nick, you were on it, and then off it, Bryony, you recently joined it. So I, I would love to stabilize it a bit. And also, um, Essence, I know you've expressed interest in the grants, and I really want to, to bring you into that fold so you can become more familiar with the process. Um, as a heads up, I will likely, I prefer not to be the grants chair starting in 2021, whatever the next year is, 2020 didn't happen. Um, so I want to help you all in the next six months or anyone who's interested in potentially becoming the grants chair to get really familiar with that process. So I want to start those meetings up again. Is everyone cool? Okay, Valeria, you're interested. Amazing. Um, I will send a, a message out to those that have told me they're interested in continuing with grants. But if anyone else hasn't told me yet, 
reach out to me. Well, okay? I can, yeah, hang on, I can add everybody right now. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Um, but yeah, I just want to pick those meetings up again and uh, at least start the conversations of what we want the grants to look like next year. So wait, it was Valeria Essence is on there. Wednesday. The next one is July 17th. Well, oh, July. <laughs> uh, uh, who else? We can do it July 17th if you all are still up for that, or we can move it to August. I, whichever one we want to start with next. Yeah, Valeria. Oh, you're yeah, I'm really happy to help. And like I said, I usually work better when people tell me what to do, <laughs> especially because I'm new. So I appreciate you give me some things to do. And yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, in essence, I have you on that meeting too. I don't know if your IU account allows you to accept Google invites, but it, it'd be a Google email. And Valerie, I just emailed you. So you should you should be on all the scheduled meetings, which is the third Friday of every month. Okay. And am I on it? You are now. Ah, uh, good. Because <laughs> I know I'm not. I'm always asking Rachel, when is the next one? I was like, I don't know. We should talk about that in the next meeting. Um, so yeah, just is everyone cool with starting July then? That's what next Friday. Uh, yeah, not this week, but following. Yes, not this week, but the following week. Awesome. Yeah, that's fine. I will be in touch with you all. Okay. Do you do you want to share why you want to step down as part of your commissioner announcements? Sure. So I still will be involved with the commission, but um, I have accepted the fellowship I received to attend grad school at RISD. So I will be getting cool. a master's degree again. <laughs> Thanks. While uh, still in Bloomington. While still in Bloomington, still working for Secretly full time and basically still doing everything that I'm doing, but I'm also trying to be smarter and say no to things, Nick, <laughs> trying to step down from things. So um, I still want to be involved and but I also want to like pass that torch on. Yeah, I think it will be a perfect opportunity for you to be able to kind of mentor somebody else into the process without, you know, somebody just taking it on without not not, not knowing what the history is or what has been done. Um, so let's jump into commissioner announcements. And Sean, you can talk about the paper pavilion project. As part I, of I can yield my time, just commissioner announcements. It's worth okay. it. Okay, yeah, it's, it's fairly late. Yeah. Any commissioner announcements? All right. Well, we'll leave it to Rachel then, and we'll adjourn this meeting at 644. Unless anybody has anything else to add. Thank you all. It's so good to see everybody. Yep, good Thank to see you, all. you, and we'll see you. public art on Friday.